キロ感、スピード感が違います。はい、これは高いです。ドロップスピンですね。よく回ってます。
はコンビネーションと今の単独、はい、2つ入りましたコンビネーションは2つ入りましたがトリプルトリプルまでは決まりませんでした。Right,、um, sorry to spoil the magic,、um, <laughs> but、uh, we're going to start having some, some talking、uh, from now. So,、uh, welcome everybody to the Dai Anglo Japanese Foundation.、Uh, my name is Jason James, and I'm just going to be chairing today. I have to start by doing some very boring housekeeping announcements, so please bear with me.、Uh, the first one is if the fire alarm should go off, you should not use the lift. Go down the stairs,、um, out the front door the way you came in, and we should congregate on the park side of the street. And the second thing is please don't leave any valuables in our cloakrooms downstairs because nobody is watching them. So if you have left a laptop in a bag or something, I'd recommend you go down and get it and bring it back up here. So、um, I'll just very briefly introduce our speakers because there are three of them and they've got plenty to say.、Um, so the first you've been watching on screen,、um, Fumie Sugudi.、Um, she is a prominent Japanese figure skater and she was in、uh, two Olympics. Um, coming fifth、uh, in 2002 and fourth in 2006.、Um, and she's been Japanese champion several times, and、uh, well, I'll let her tell you about it later.、Um, and then our second speaker is going to be Noel Thatcher, MBE, who is a British Paralympic runner、uh, who was actually at six、uh, Paralympic Games representing the UK and collected five gold medals over the course of them.、Um, and interestingly, Noel also speaks Japanese. Uh, which is perhaps how we've managed to tempt him to come along. But、um, I think he's mainly going to be speaking English there. He said he had a Japanese joke, but his wife told him he couldn't tell it. <laughs>、um, and our third speaker will be Dr. Vasil Girginov,、um, who is reader in sport management and development at Brunel University in London.、Um, and he's worked as an advisor to the chairman of the Bulgarian Sports Union,、um, but published a number of books about sports, sports management.、Um, and I think he will. Perhaps、uh, do a bit more of the big picture stuff for us. And I've also been asked just before Fumie stands up and gives her speech to give you a little bit of history on the Winter Olympics. I'm not quite sure why I've been asked to do this, but it's quite interesting.、Um, so in 1924,、uh, was the first time that figure skating was involved in the Olympics, and that was actually the London Olympics. No, no, that's Shannon. That's sh sorry,、uh, okay, when was the London one?、Uh, 1908, okay, right, we've got the history here. <laughs> 1908 was the London one, and they had figure skating, but they didn't actually have a Winter Olympics. It was a sort of Olympics that went on for about six months, so in the UK that would probably include winter at some point.、Um, so they, they had figure skating in that.、Um, so the first、uh, proper Winter Olympics was the one in Chamonix in 1924.、Um, and there were also three, well, there were supposed to have been three Winter Olympics in Japan. Uh, the first one was in 1940, though, so it was going to have been in Sapporo in 1940 and was cancelled because of the Second World War.、Um, and so Sapporo got its chance eventually in 1972.、Uh, 
And then I'm sure many of you will remember more recently we had a Winter Olympics in Nagano in 1998. Um, but we've never had a Winter Olympics in the UK, just that figure skating. Um, so that's the potted history of Winter Olympics, and I'd like to hand over to Fumie. Okay. Good evening, everyone. My name is Fumi Seguri. Um, I'm really looking forward to coming to London here and wanted to say very thank you for uh, Daiwa Foundation to invite me here because um, um, Shoko was really working hard for me to come here. Um, actually, this is my third time to come to London. First time was 1990. Uh, nine, uh, 2006, um, right after the Tallinn Olympics, and the second time was last year, and this is my third time. I really remember that um, 2000, oh, uh, 2006 when I come here first time. Um, the reason why I came here was uh, meeting a very famous British um, conductor and co composer, Carl Jenkins. Um, to have um, uh, to have his um, permission to use his music. Um, everyone think that why like I have to have his permission, um, and I have to tell this story. Um, at that time, we skater are not allowed to use the vocal music, and he's uh, he was very famous that he had a, a music band unit called uh, Adiemas, which they used, uh, uh, it's, he said it's not vocal. They use their word as uh, instrumental. So, and then like I was, um, I, 2006, I already skated like, kind of like long time. So, kind of run of idea. Like I did a lot of like uh, new things. And then, like I met, like I find this um, like beautiful music with um, like a word, word vo, vo, it, They don't say vocal, so I don't know like how can I explain. But um, then I thought, oh my God, I have to use this music. But then it was really, really dangerous because the rule says it's not allowed to do the vocal. But he himself said that it's not vocal. So and then like I. Right. Okay. So just in case we needed to have his permission, like uh, right, this is to say that this is not vocal, and also uh, which was uh, when I look back to that, it's a really tough thing that to ask one of the famous composer to do so. But um, I was uh, my sponsor was called Avex, uh, which is kind of big com company in like in Japan, like music company. And then um, they tried hard to take contact with him, um, get his you know very busy person, but he made us for the time, and he re like re edit for the music, and uh, like the time like I I was so young and I did not think that it was really hard work, but you know I ask I ask so many people to run out run for this you know project so. But um, finally, uh, I think they released the album so to sell. So I think it was good. Okay, <laughs> I did this. We have the video of that uh, performance. So oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to see my performance anymore because they will say, "Oh my God, Fumi got so get old." <laughs> <laughs> That's why I did not have so much time to, you know, in Eng to speak in English. I better do like read this English instead of not doing so much time to take for my makeup. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't changed that bit, so don't worry. <laughs> Thank 
ことはできませんが女性の声を歌詞ではなく楽器のように取り入れた楽曲です最初のコンビネーション完璧です現代版シンデレラ苦しい時も負けずにいつも明るく振る舞えるようなそんな女性を演じたいとすぐりの話です。ジャンプは完璧もう一つトリプルです。コンビネーショントリプルフリップダブルトーリップいいですねー中盤の見せ場For little skaters, like、um, different life coaching. Actually, you guys see the programs the skater skating, and、um, I do make the choreography for them, choose the music, and you know, set the, the technique where it is good for you know, getting the points.、Um, that is my job right now, and、um, I have a lot of like, like little skaters which are not born. 
that 2006 or 2007, like two, like teacher, like I said, um, like mom, moms are like my age. And they said, oh my God, like, you know, and they said, no, definitely. They know Maasara or something, but you know, they don't know. And they said like, teacher, I'm not born in 2002 or 2000. <laughs> my God, it's like, like, it's already like 15 years. Like, like, has like time fly and I was like, I felt so old. My God, <laughs> that's the least story. And, um, and then, um, um, I think back, like what Olympic meant to me. I went um, to um, the first time was to um, 1998, uh, which was in Nagano Olympic. Uh, that was my first time that I think about the Olympic. And the next one was 2002 Salt Lake Olympic, which I uh, participated. And 2006 um, Torino Olympic was my second. Um, time to participate, um, but always Olympic was uh, like in Japanese called kikkake, and uh, probably it's like turning point, like key point, always gave me in my life. Um, two so, um, 1998, um, I was uh, had a chance to go to Olympic at the time, but the. Uh, figure skating girls only have one spot left, and it was very tough um, competition there. And I'm um, actually, I, the last national, I could not skate very well there, and I could not go there. Um, I w I had a, I got injured at the time, so I thought myself at, right after I thought, okay, so this is what's not the chance. Like I take it easy. But later on, like one month later, the Nagano Olympic started and the TV shows a lot and I saw it like and then I start to realize that oh my god, I lost really, really big chance. Maybe I can go to this Olympic. There's not so many people that have chance to have the uh, Olympic which is um, held in their own country and I might have a chance there and I lose it. And after that, I felt um, Olympic was really meant to me in my life. And after that, I started to really, really work hard to for the next uh, 2002 Olympic, um, Salt Lake City. <coughs> and then, um, like, not only my work, um, always my team worked so hard for me, and I get really close. And I got, um, t I final at the national, I got the spot. But um, 2001, um, there was a big, um, September 11th, the terror was there. And the Olympic was, uh, of course, it was Salt Lake City, so it was held in the United States. And many people was uh, questioning about what is like life, what is living, like, because it's like, you know, like a, you know, like this, like people die easily. And like very many people struggle, what is like living, what is life? And when I saw that um, many people are getting really down, I thought maybe I'm not, not that good, but what if I can be like uh, Moonlight? Uh, how? If I'm really happy that if I can sh show the people the way, even if it's a darkness, and um, that's why I uh, wanted to do my best performance in the Olympic. And um, this was the um, thing that always my choreographer tells me: Please skate from your heart. Please not skate for resort, not skate for uh, only yourself, please skate for audience and please skate for, you know, from your heart. And then, um, yeah, I had a very great experience in Olympic, but I finished fifth, I like, could not reach the medal. I felt I was really 
enjoyed and satisfied what I've done. I think I did 100% at the time, but I felt something, I was lacking something. And then again, I wanted, okay, so I have to find again at the next Olympics and I start again to the next four years. Definitely, like, I thought it was, um, I was win the national at the time, and I thought it was easy to do another four years, but it wasn't, because um, I did a lot of injury. Maybe, maybe my body was not strong enough, or maybe I was a bit wild girl, <laughs> like, always. I, actually, at this Salt Lake Olympic, I was injured, like, two days before. Um, I did not do the draw for my, you know, for my performance. Um, I fell. Like I fell really bad way and my knee got like this big and I have to go to the you know medical and then two doctor put the injection and then like have to take out my blood outside because it was like this. And then I'll, like it was two days before and I thought, oh my God, why I every time, like why I have something? Why things not going like easy? And then I thought, oh my God, like what I should do. And I was lying, you no, know, lying on the bed. And but I think, you know, maybe I'm too wild. So it was. I learned from many things. But um, and then, like going back to the, you know, the story. Um, actually, um, I had a lot of injuries. So my team, my um, like ballet coach, my physio, wanted to change my um, actually technique of using my body. So uh, we did a lot of work, but at the same time, I lost my technique. Like I, you know, I could not do jumps. I'm trying the same way, but could not do. Like, you know, very hard for years. But then, um, and but I think there was something. God was there, and um, fine at the final, really last moment, I take the ticket to the Olympic, and then. Um, I went to the Torino Olympic, but then again I was fourth. Um, I did, I think I did really, um, again, I did I think 100%, but then I thought like what was missing? Like it's not, it's something missing and um, I have to find this. Um, we did a lot of competition, but I have to find what was missing in my life at the Olympic. So that's the reason why next one I continued doing another four years and then like like and on and on and on. And like oh, four years later. I could not attend the Olympic four years, like again try again, four years. And then my monitor said, Okay, forget it. <laughs> you have to move on. <laughs> but um and um actually this is a little story. Um at the before the train Olympics, like I start um, I don't know the in in like in British they have a habit to um, genkatsugi like how do you, like so how do you explain this? Genkatsugi, you uh, you're kind of superstitious. And you do something and then something else happens. You know that kind of thing. So you so, make a routine of the superstitious something. Yeah. So I. Um, I love sweets, and then I said, okay, I have to like stop eating something for this Olympics. Um, you know, Olympics meant so much to me. And then I said, okay, I can stop eating pudding. pudding. So like, I, okay, so pudding, I stopped eating before like 2005. And then I could not go to the, you know, I wasn't finished well at the Torino Olympic. So okay, I could not eat, eat like if I cannot finish well. Okay, now again, like I have to, you know, keep this rule for me for next four rules. And then I could not go to the four, so and then I continue not eating my pudding. And it takes eight years. And then the last, like, um, retirement, um, at the retirement um, interview when I did it in Japan, my manager asked, okay, you can eat it now at the interview conference. Okay, that was the story about the pudding, and later, after on, like so much pudding, like I was eating the, like, because many people know it, and then, you know, okay, now you can eat pudding, so, you know, everyone present, six months, I was eating the pudding almost every day, <laughs> and so that's the, you know, the funny story behind, but, um, so, um, Olympic, 
always um, give me like to, to the next step, next step. Um, I wasn't, I think, um, I, uh, like when I look back, it, I wasn't very talented. I, my body was not strong. Maybe my body very slow, like like muscles very not remember very well, like technique, you know, had very lost things. But um, I think Olympic bring me um, a lot of things to learn. For example, um, like um, it is um, learning about the life as well, because. Um, uh, figure skating. Even if you fall at the first jump, you have to forget it and stand up, and you have to must go on. Like life is the same. Even if you you know have some bad thing, you know you have to. You cannot think the back like what you've done. You have to go forward. That's the same thing in like skating routine as well. Sometimes when I teaching, I felt really. Um, sorry for my little skater. They have to learn from very little. And funny thing is, uh, figure skating. <coughs> most of the movements are backwards, like this, backwards. But they have to like go forward. <laughs> so I think this is very funny. Things that in figure skating movement backwards, but you know go forward. So um, I now I teaches a lot of technique for my skaters, but most of the thing is not teaching a technique. Most of the thing is teaching how you live in your own life. And that is the important thing, and also we can learn from the sports. Um, and um, I think, so I have to talk about 2002 Tokyo Olympics? You don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> Am I not talking too long? Um, I think it's a, about Pretty time. Much. Okay. 2020. Okay. Um, a little bit. Um, I think um, people know that um, from uh, this year will be uh, five years after London Olympic. Actually, the London Olympic started from July 27th, 2011. So pretty five years from that time. Um, I think um, London Olympic was very um, successful Olympic, uh, known as uh, financially their very su successful Olympic. And um, in Japan right now, um, they're trying so hard, like how can they make financially successful? For example, like. What can they do? Made the big arena, and what can they do after? They're just thinking about, you know, the financial side. But I think um, what um, the thing, what was really successful in London Olympic was they um, make um, they are staying in their heart, in not only uh, just watch they had their body remember. Like um, they listen, they felt the wind, like they smelled. So the person who had experienced the two like two thousand eleven London Olympic, they knew the excitement, like what was happening on during that Olympic. So that's why they could invite it another big games. For example, they're going to have a um, track and a world championship track and field next month in August, which is um, many people are really looking forward because um, Bolt, um, the track, um, uh, he's might gonna retired after this. Like huge, a lot of people are so you know focusing in this competition. It's not only that they are really successful in financially. They re all people remember, and I still when I come to London, like they talking about the, how exciting it was, the London Olympic was. So I think um, the first thing 2020 Tokyo Olympic have to make what? How can they make the Olympics 
say in their own heart, like you know, to have that experience. So we needed to learn from London that you know thing, and um, I hope uh, we can have a good Olympic in Tokyo. Just uh, first of all, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you, Daiwa. Thank you, everybody, for uh, asking me. Um, sometimes Japanese-speaking Paralympians to be part of this um, great panel. I have some very esteemed colleagues here, and I hope to, uh, <laughs> to deliver a, half of as uh, if I can deliver half as exciting a presentation as could be. I'll be very, very happy. Very interesting. Some parallels with, between our two careers, given that we've only met each other for about ten minutes. Uh, both uh, like a slice of cake. Um, I'm both got injured a lot, apparently, so we've already got things in common. Um, I do need someone to switch these slides when uh, that's over. Oh, you're going to use that, which yep. is where? Sorry, this is the first lesson you get in, in the struggles of a visually impaired person. <laughs> if I just say next, could you press it for me? Is that yep, all right? Cool, cool. excellent. The second lesson is cooperation is everything. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, that's me, um, Noel Thatcher, apparently. I, I was asked to discuss, uh, well, give you a brief history of the Paralympic movement. I also spent a, about five minutes with us, it, it quickly becomes apparent that he knows ten times more about the history of my own movement than, than I do, but we'll, we'll go through some of the salient points. So, if you have the first slide, please. The Paralympic movement, per se, um, came to be um, in 1944 when the British government asked Ludwig Gutmann, then Ludwig Gutmann, later you know, Sir Ludwig Gutmann, to set up um, a spinal injury centre at Stoke Manville Hospital, which, bizarrely enough, I later worked at um, as a physiotherapy student, um, to help with the rehabilitation of servicemen who had become injured during the Second World War. Um, and like many pioneers in lots of different fields, he was a, an amazing man, a visionary. There have been some excellent films made about his life, and I would urge you to watch them because they're incredibly inspiring. But his idea was to, to use sport to, to rehabilitate, not just physically, but also mentally and spiritually. Um, and competition became very, very important. So, 1948 um, saw the first Stoke Man Mandeville Games. That, that, it's, it's, it's widely accepted that that was the sort of first Paralympic Games, as it were. But there were only a, a number of archers, and I can't, was it 16 archers? Yeah, yeah, probably 16. Um, just taking part in one sport. And it wasn't until 1952 that the Games truly became international when we had a few Dutch people there as well, which, um, given the current size of the Paralympic movement with 163 countries, it was just small beginnings. Um, I may do this, but next, next um, important point, I think, is obviously Rome. 1960, 400 athletes, 23 countries, and the games lately have that held every four years. Tol sorry, 1960, right? 1964, Tokyo Games, where we we saw again Oda Fields as the as the stage for what was actually a fairly significant sort of milestone in, in the Paralympic movement, with lots more athletes in wheelchairs taking part. Albeit the game was still split between two um, countries, Tokyo and also Stoke Mandeville, which, which, main, which became sort of really the, the ongoing hub of Paralympic activity. Um, where am I getting there? Okay. I'll, I'll just literally cluster these because I think cluster these can talk an awful lot more about history, but obviously, as the years went by, more and more athletes with more and more disabilities became part of the Paralympic movement. More and more organisations got involved, leading, and I think we should just keep going through this so that I can just get to that, get to the interesting stuff in there, um, was the, luckily the, the, I'll go around this side, I can actually see this a little bit better, so this may make things in a lot of detail. So, 1988 with the next point, which I think was really important in the development of the Paralympic movement, was the first time that the Olympics and Paralympic Games took place in the same host city. And that's my second Paralympic game. But it was a significant moment in our lives as Paralympians to be competing in a full um, Olympic stadium in front of 80,000, 90,000 spectators. You know, having, well, I'll come to, back to that in a second. 
So, International Paralympic Committee was born in 1989 in Bonn, um, with Spirit in Motion as its slogan. And I think there's, a, there's an interesting point there. Paralympic movement in its early years was very much still about giving people with a disability a platform on which to demonstrate their ability. But it was very much the triumph over a adversity type of approach to marketing the games. And, and the first few articles that were written about um, me were very much, uh, you know, I can't see very well, you can run quite quickly, and isn't that amazing? Yeah? Um, fortunately, we've moved on a little bit from there. So we'll get to the next slide. <laughs> okay. 2012. Was anybody at the 2012 Paralympic Games? Olympic Games? Okay, so I don't need to talk to you about that. It was, it was an absolute game changer. Um, numbers of athletes, number of participating countries. But more importantly, from my point of view, how the country, well, the organising committee, how the country, how the volunteers, and how the media took the Paralympic movement to heart. Um, commercial partners investing in, in solely in the Paralympic Games, not, not sponsoring the, the uh, Olympic team, so Sainsbury's looking solely after the Paralympic Games. It was an incredible moment for me walking through Westfield, Stratford, City Mall, and seeing 20 metre um, poster of David Weir in a wheelchair. You know, this is an entire game change, not only from the Paralympic point of view, but also potentially from a societal point of view, in terms of changing attitudes towards para sport. Um, I'll just kind of go through this. Okay, so this is where we get to the interesting stuff. I can start the old anecdote or sort of a few funny stories bit. So, 23rd of, of the 1st, 1966, significant mo moment in the development of the Paralympic movement, because that's me when I was born. Okay, <laughs> okay I, I actually wrote under here in Japanese, Kai Yishon. <laughs> All right. See, it would have worked as a joke, I think, but my, you know, my wife told me to take it out. Um, so, <coughs> are you other ones I was Okay, uh, but afterwards, when I was doing this on my iPhone with my little app on the bus, I thought, you know, no barriers, no limits. And that was actually not my personal um, mantra, as it were, but it's very much my parents' approach to bringing me up. So I was born with a condition called optic atrophy. Um, which is a degenerative disease of the retina and the optic nerve. So I, I could never see well. I don't know what it's like to see well. So please, if there's anyone from the media, don't ask me how much I can see because I've absolutely no idea what it is to see a bus coming at, at 10 yards away. Um, obviously, I'm getting on a bit now. I've got quite used to my sight loss and I, and I function reasonably well. And you could be forgiven for thinking that you know, I've got more than I have. And I think one of my parents colleagues uh, Yesterday, an interview described this as a, a, an invisible disability because you can't see it. I don't know about prosthetic leg or etc. Anyway, but my parents were incredibly proactive, and the first sign of any kind of um, uh, what's it, active talent, if you want. My, uh, my part was when I was four years old, and my parents were camping in, in Wales, and my dad was a really serious snow and ice climber and, and mountaineer. Um, and my mum dad turned it back, and I was 60 metres up a rock face, apparently. Um, then the problem started because I couldn't get down and that was a whole different story. But obviously, you know, if you, the, the, the point here, and I think it's a significant one, is if you don't tell someone they can't do it, they won't know. Okay? If you enable people, then you, you give them the means to achieve their potential, to realise, you know, I, I, think it's, I think it's you know translatable to lots of different walks of life, not only sport, but there are many of us here probably who are in a position here that we didn't think we'd be in when we were younger, um, and that's what I, that's why I've got from that. But okay, okay. Second huge milestone in the development um, of my Paralympic life. This is um, Exor Grange Special School. So up until I was ten, I went to a, a school for the uh, just a body school. So I was the only visually impaired child there. The only um, adjustment that was made was that uh, I was given a big desk with a big um, lid that lifted up okay, to bring the book closer to my face and I had to carry that around from lesson to lesson with my mates which meant I, I got really strong but I didn't have very many friends. Um, okay, so but the headmaster of the school, um, George Marshall, who later was given a CBE for his contribution to educating visually impaired people, he was a, he was a world leader and again he used, a bit like Ludwig Guzman in a sense, he used sport as a, as a punishment, no, rehabilitative tool <laughs> to develop our, our ability. So there were 200 boys and 100 girls, it wasn't all bad. Um, 
we're all visually impaired, and three times a week we were made to go out cross country running um, in all sorts of weathers. And to put it mildly, I absolutely hated it. Did everything in my power to get out of it. I used to try and cheat and hide in the trees and things around the course, and you know, come in trying to look tired at the end. But I got and that's really really short. But I got caught having my one and only cigarette when I was 12, 13 years old and sent out every night to do five mile runs by my housemaster and he follows in the car and chases around and <laughs> that's how I, it's after this kind of intense block of training <laughs> that I um, came third in the school cross country championships and later on in my life, we, as a school, we, we won the Warwickshire Schools Cross Country Championships. Now, this is the problem word, okay, in the description of this school, because everybody in the community thought that we had some kind of intellectual impairment or, you know, special has some fairly negative connotations in the heads and mouths of, of the wrong people. Um, so it was great delight that we won the Warwickshire Schools Cross Country Championships as a team of four visually impaired boys. Three of us wearing football boots. You know, it was a, an incredible point. And I think when we went to the Paralympic Games, um, actually, let's open the next slide. Okay, so 18 years old, moved on a little bit. Hair hasn't got much better. Um, <laughs> this actually, I don't think it was actually from the Paralympics. I think this was my very first international competition, which was in Bulgaria. There you go. Um, in, in Varna. And as you can see, crowds throng the place, you know, virtually in media everywhere. So the team <laughs> that went out to, um, to Bulgaria and subsequently to 1984 consisted of, I think, 10 swimmers and 10 athletes. Um, so 20 in, in total and 10 or 11 came from our school. Okay, and that's how important that environment was, and that's how important a, a positive environment is to developing both sporting potential, but you know, young people in general. Okay, let's have the next one. Okay, my ne touched on this a little bit. I apologize by the slides, but this is what happens when you try and do a keynote presentation on an iPhone, on a bus, during a commute, when you're visually impaired. But they're a bit, bit, they're a bit blurry, but to be fair, you know, welcome to my world. Um, all right. Um, so, sorry, New York, 1984. Um, I can't even see my own slide. Um, this, was, this was really interesting. Um, it, Wally, does anybody remember the LA Olympics? Apart from us, he remembers everything about everything. Um, as you'll soon find out. Um, that was when we had the rocket man landing in the Olympic Stadium and Carl Lewis doing his thing. And this amazing, you know, California, Hollywood razzmatazz. So, well, we were in a university campus on Long Island, okay? And when I looked up from the, from the blocks for, the, for my 400 meters final, they, I realized there were less people in the stands than were actually on the track competing. So it was a very low-key affair. I was 18, I was in New York with my friends, and it was more like a working holiday um, than, than a sporting competition. Seoul, I touched on it briefly, first time in the Olympic Stadium, huge crowds. Now, the Korean organizers took the uh, junior step of inviting lots and lots and lots of children to take part. So the stadium was packed, but it was really noisy. If you can imagine what an enormous soft play area. Anybody got children? Young children, okay. So it's like a huge soft play, really. It's just incredibly noisy, a really, really powerful like, a a atmosphere. But um, for me, personally, very, 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 very tough games. I somehow put it into my head before the build-up to the games that the less I ate, the, f the skinnier I'd get, the faster I'd run. So. Off the board of that sort of borderline eating disorder type mentality, which athletes do tend to slip into, particularly distance runners, I really had struggled, and I won the 800 meters by 400 to the second, which I think about that, that, that much. But it was a real step forward for us being in the, in the, in the stadium, and I remember going into the city with some friends, some swimmers, um, um, and the food was awful. I mean, I like yeah. kim kimchi now, okay? But when you are young, impressionable, 22, 22 year old, yeah. Um, it's, it's a little bit of a shock to the system. So we try and get people to take us into the city and, and go to you know, Denny's or whatever. And um, we got a cab back one night, and I was with one of my friends who was another 800 meter runner, um, two swimmers, both girls, one of them was totally blind. And we knew the way back and forward from the village, and we weren't going that way. And I was totally convinced. I don't know why. This is, this is probably terrible indictment of my social awareness. Well, I thought we were getting kidnapped. Um, <laughs> And we got taken outside to, uh, we, we got taken to what looked like very, it looked like um, some sort of downtown Seoul, shall we say. Um, and the cab driver jumped out of the cab, locked the door, which didn't do anything to my nerves, ran into this building, 
came out with his entire family just to take pictures. So from a Paralympic point of view, this is an incredible, incredible movement. So, anyway, moment. Right, moving forward, okay, Barcelona, 1992. Now this, again, I think is a pivotal game in the development of the Paralympic movement. And again, I'm talking about track and field, sorry, that, that, that's what I do. Um, Catalonian people had some issues with the over sort of, the, well, certainly the economic implications of the Olympic Games for them in Catalonia. And I, they were kind of equivocal about the Olympic Games, but when it came to the Paralympic Games, they really got behind it. And we had the most amazing crowds, the most passionate crowds, the, the biggest crowds. Um, my course has really helped having beaten two Spaniards into <laughs> in the 1500 meters where I won the gold. Um, but in the closing ceremony, we were dragged off the track into the stands and given, you know, sangria and goodness knows what else. And it really was a, a, a very, very powerful moment in, para, in Paralympic sport. This picture here actually isn't, isn't for me uh, winning the 1500 meters. This is my friend, who sadly is no longer with us. He died in the, you know, in the tragic car accident on the back of. Uh, after uh, the last race, uh, it was a 10k road race in Italy, um, about Mike Kikolsky, but him winning the 8 meters and me coming third. So I, but I love the picture, I just can't. It's one of those pictures that I think will live with me and really just catches, even though we're rivals, yeah, we're going through that moment together. You know? And I've made so many, so many friends from all over the world through, through my sport. Moving on, to bang them at me. Okay, just after 1992, I got invited to, to take to um, take part in the marathon in Japan, and that's how I've come to be here tonight, I think. Um, I, I subsequently dropped out of that marathon with an injury, but went back to Japan an awful, awful lot. And, and after 1992, having won 1,500 metres, my coach and I sat down and went, well, what would be really, really, really good? You know, what are you going to do now, Noel? In 1990, I've won five gold medals in the same world championships at all the distances from 400 to 5,000 metres. We thought, well, we'll try and emulate Emil Zatopek from 1952, Helsinki and we'll try and win the 5k, the 10k and the marathon in the same game. And to cut a very long story short, I decided that I was quite quick, but I was mentally very weak. So I'd go off to Japan, I'd seen Toshiko Seiko, um, Seiko Toshiko, sorry, um, the Soul Brothers, earlier in the, the 60s, Kimihara Sensei, there's this incredible strength, this steely resilience, that, that expressionless running face. That I, and I kind of got it into my own head that if I'm going to win, do this travel, I better go out to Japan and get proper Japan, Japan tough. Um, <laughs> it's a phrase I'm calling for this evening. Um, and <laughs> this is the only picture I can find of me running in Japan, which is actually in uh, Oita, in Yamake. It's about 150 meters from my um, in law's back garden. Um, but let's just say it's not all tropical, is it? <laughs> but um, I, so I subsequently went out to Japan to race and train probably three or four times a year. In the build up to 1996, I faced myself in Nagano for altitude training. And while all the other Japanese um, athletes, um, <coughs> and I was really lucky to train with Asa Hikase, uh, Okidenki Miyazaki, um, they all went to train in New Zealand. I went to Miyazaki, where they were all leaving, um, <laughs> um, which is a bit of a record. But it, it worked out very, very well. Um, well. I got myself very, very fit. But sadly, also gave myself um, a stress fracture of my left lift. Tibia. So three weeks before the games, I could not run three meters, let alone 5,000, 10,000 meters. I was really lucky to be taken on board by the Asahika um, team doctor, um, and you know, after four hours of running up and down the swimming pool and lots and lots of honey, I kind of got myself in, in good enough. Next, next slide, please. To win the gold medal in the 5,000 and 10,000 meters. more Nihon king medal. <laughs> I, I think it's down to Japan that I was able to win, to win those, those two. And again, Atlanta, difficult point, Olympic-wise and Paralympic-wise, because of the overall sort of commercialism of the, associated with the Games. And I'm a runner, you know, I run because I love running, and I run from the heart. It really doesn't matter to me who's sponsoring. I, nobody's sponsoring there. Ten people in the crowd, 100,000 people in the crowd, I'm still going to try and win that race and enjoy that race. But Atlanta was particularly difficult for us as Paralympians, because as soon as the Olympics had finished, the athletes' village was stripped of everything. Microwaves, heaters, fans, everything went. Um, and we were left with what was left over, and it was a really difficult, difficult time. Fortunately, the wife, and forgive me, if anybody knows it here, of either Honda or Toyota USA, and I can't remember which one, took me under her wing. She was working with the Japanese team as a translator. And she took me out to lots of Japanese restaurants, and I got food sent from Japan. <laughs> and that's how I managed, I think, to win those, those two gold medals, so, which was really, 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 really fortunate. So, 
Sydney, huge, huge change. Australians love sport. They really don't care who's doing it. Then it's disability. It's it. The person's in a wheelchair, they've got a prosthetic leg. They just love sport. And it was, a, it was another turning point. Full stadium. Remember, after winning a bronze in the 10,000 meters, taking three hours to walk 400 meters to the cafe in the Olympic Park because of all the autographs, people who got there with champagne, Guinness, some great so 5,000 meters three days later. Um, but um, so I didn't partake, but really took the parents to heart. And I think we've still got our names carved into the statues outside the Olympic Park in Sydney, which, you know, when you start off as a schoolboy in that school, running across country, running around, that, that, that's quite a significant moment. I know times, uh, this man's got lots of interest in stuff, so I'll wish through to the next one. Okay. Obviously, the success of the Paralympic movement brought with it increased media attention, um, and that itself has just led to, to a huge explosion in, in awareness around the Paralympic movement. Where there's more, more, more awareness, the more people get involved, we inspire different, younger athletes, athletes from different countries, from developing countries to come through. And I think this, you know, that's the media, particularly the British media, have played such a pivotal role in developing this you know, wave of support for the Paralympic movement. I was in the stadium yesterday for the Para World Athletic Championships, and it's just getting better every year. You know, these are household names now, Johnny Peacock, Richard Whitehead, and Cockcroft, the people who are winning gold medals, and 30,000 people are turning up to pay to watch athletes with a disability, because it's great sport, but it's also worth it commercially, it's worth it politically, it's worth it in terms of societal development. It's such an important um, part of the Olympic and Paralympic movement now. We can move forward. Okay. Athletes 2004, notable from my point of view as an athlete, as the only time I ever came back from a championship ever without a medal. Um, and that's quite an interesting thing, because normally what happens when you finish a race, they drag you off to a the medal ceremony and get taken out, everybody takes your picture and everybody tells you how well you've done. When you don't win a medal, this is this huge, long, dark tunnel. <laughs> and there's nobody there, you know? And it's a very, very different, different experience. But I was very lucky to be, so to my peers, to carry the flag for the team, which was a, a massively proud moment. It's been selected by the, by the athletes, I think, it's actually you know, it, to represent their <coughs> hopes, you know, their games, their, their desire, their determination, their fight. That was incredible. Um, I think, is that one of those No. Then we come on to London, and again, I touched on it a little bit, but wow, you know, I, I missed um, any association with Beijing. Sadly, after Athens and not winning anything, I decided that, you know, living my life in four year cycles and, and running 120 miles a week and sacrificing career development wasn't really sustainable if I was ever going to be able to keep my wife somewhere to live. Um, so I concentrated on career and I came back to 2012 um, as a commentator for the pundit for the BBC. So it's really interesting. The first time I got to see this view, actually, from an amazing studio on the top of the tower block, you know, the Olympic Park. But what a game changer! Um, and I touched on that, and I won't elaborate on that because I'm sure that's how you have some feelings about that. But you know, suffice to say, 90,000 people watching Johnny Peacock run 100 meters. You know, paying to watch Johnny Peacock run 100. That this is the challenge, I think for Tokyo going forwards. It, I, I know Tokyo will be fantastic. It, whatever happens, Tokyo will be fantastic. They've done all sorts of fun. You know, I think facilities will be fantastic. Volunteers will be fantastic. Um, tech will be fantastic. It will be safe. It will be efficient. It will be great. The heart, this is what we need to develop now, is the, is, is the heart of Japan played out in a Paralympic stadium. That's what I, my real hope is, that everything I experienced in Japan that warmth, that passion, tradition, culture, will all come out in those performances. And you're beginning to see it now. Yesterday, um, day before yesterday, sorry, there was a um, totally blind Japanese um, 5,000 meter runner called Wadashinya, who won a bronze medal um, in 5,000 meters. Um, I was there yesterday for his medals, medal ceremony. Uh, with a, a uh, message from a friend in Tokyo this morning saying that that actually made prime time news in Japan. So we're starting to create these icons. We're starting to create these Paralympic figures, which I think will start to trigger that culture change. So that's me done. Tokyo, I'm not able to say. Ah, sorry, I put one more slide up there. You've, we've covered the. We've covered the um, anybody know who these guys are? Let's, let's test how popular the Paralympians are. Who's this? Sarah Story. Great stuff. You can't answer the next question, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Who's this? Did someone say it? 
And he's with Elisa. Yeah, and you know that guy. David. Yeah, absolutely. So this, I think that's a testament to my point that, you know, if you guys know who Karen is, Dog Medal is star, we are very close to being there. So I'll around with you say. Any other time I said? Thank you very much. instead of uh, enjoying the fun when outside. Um, uh, first of all, a couple of uh, thanks I know that to the Foundation for this very kind invitation uh, to talk to you tonight and for all the support that you've been given to um, research and different projects. Uh, I also feel enormously privileged uh, to share the stage with a couple of outstanding athletes. I'm afraid I cannot compete in any way or shape or form <laughs> with um, what they have achieved personally. Uh, it's absolutely phenomenal, amazing. And um, uh, I consider myself a social scientist, and our job as social scientists is not just to record the Olympic Games, what happened at the Games, who won what, but to interrogate them. So I'm going to give a slightly different perspective on the Olympic Games. Early in all, ask me, uh, I, I, I said, I very much look forward to your presentation. So what do you think about the, the Paralympics? And I said, well, both Olympics and the Paralympics are very messy. And I immediately realized that, you know, he may just drop. I mean, yeah. he's such a passionate person and he loves what he does and all the rest. And I, I, I gave him this, this verdict. Um, it's not about a verdict, but just, but just a, a view and opinion. So I would like to uh, talk a little bit about what is behind the Olympic Games. Because we all enjoy the Olympic Games, you know, the 16 or 17 days of the spectacle, and we um, uh, feel passionate about the performances of our athletes and athletes of other countries. But um, it's important to remember what is actually behind the Olympic Games. Well, I decided to add a bit of a tragical element to the presentation <laughs> since we are um, sharing a bit of a Japanese hospitality tonight. <laughs> there are two important um, uh, concepts, if you like. Um, and we, we all tend to talk about Olympic Games, but we rarely mention the first word, which is Olympism. And, and this is the whole idea behind the Olympic Games. Okay? The Olympic Games are just the pinnacle, they're the manifestation of something else, uh, which is actually Olympism. And this gentleman here, which I'm sure will be familiar, uh, well, it is Pierre de Coubertin, the French uh, educator and internationalist, who uh, is credited to have revived the uh, modern Olympic Games as we know them today, but of course, the Games have a, a long history. So, uh, Coubertin, I'm not sure if you will be able to read this, but his idea was that he wanted to uh, revive the Games um, because he felt that there was a demand, there was a need for an event like this. Uh, we have to remember that when Kubitem uh, called the first uh, Congress in 1894 in the Sorbonne in, in Paris and then later uh, inaugurated the Mont Olympic Games, this was the time of internationalization. Uh, the, the whole spirit of internationalization was very much in the air. Uh, a, a number of international organizations started to emerge. So the International Olympic Committee was one of the first international uh, organizations to emerge. But he felt the need uh, to um, use sport to um, encourage young people in particular and, uh, and use sport as an educational means to develop new citizens in the world, citizens who will be appreciative of other cultures, who will share. And he, um, if you read this quote from Coubertin, uh, which he wrote in 1908, this is the time of the uh, London Olympic Games, the first London Olympic Games, um, he, he felt that this kind of activity, this kind of sporting games, was not just for a particular country or a group of countries, but it's, it, it was something for, for the humanity in general. So he was a humanist. He, uh, and this is why he developed this universal uh, philosophy called Olympism, um, uh, which claims the status of philosophical, uh, philosophical anthropology. And philosophical anthropology tries to answer the basic question, the perennial question of, of, of philosophy. What is a human being? 
and Kubitain very much wanted to offer an answer to this question. He believed, he really believed that um, people share common values, that they share common humanity, and we can use sport to um, develop a, 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 a new breed of citizens um, who will uh, develop a completely new world. So that was the idea, uh, in a nutshell, behind the um, um, Olympism as a philosophy. So, um, in a nutshell, Olympism emphasizes very much the role of sport in society, in developing, uh, in world development, in um, international understanding, in peaceful coexistence. These are all uh, important values for uh, all, all um, human, mankind, regardless of where we live and um, where we belong to. But interestingly enough, uh, Olympism is also, the way it evolved over the years, uh, is also a social movement for change. The whole idea of Olympic Games and Olympism is, is for change. I mean, Kubitain wanted to develop different kind of people. He wanted to educate young people to be very different from the current generation uh, in Europe and, of course, elsewhere. So by definition, Olympism and Olympic Games are um, examples of movements for, for, for change. And as with any social movement, um, Olympic movement also makes a number of claims. In fact, three major claims. Um, the first one is the program claims, which uh, has to do with using sport for education, for personal development, for excellence. Uh, then the Olympic movement also makes identity claims, uh, which are based on the unity of uh, different sports movements in the world and the, the, the notion of solidarity. So for example, right now we have about 2005 national Olympic committees and the world solidarity is critical for all of them because they feel as they are part of uh, something bigger, which is the Olympic movement. And of course, um, uh, the Olympic movement makes standing claims, uh, which usually equate the Olympics and Olympic uh, National Olympic Committee to life with similar international organizations that promote similar ideas. So if you listen, for example, to the previous uh, head of the United Nations, Martin Soon, he was saying that the Olympic values are the values of the United Nations. So, which of course makes all the things very, very happy and proud. But, as you can imagine, any social movement for change is bound to uh, uh, cross, if you like, the uh, ideas or plans of other groups of society. So this is what makes the Olympic movement a contingent movement. Because every time you try to promote a certain claim, for example, to develop young people, to make them play sports, uh, inevitably you are bound to get some uh, resistance or maybe um, to um, come across different views. For example, people who are not interested necessarily in sport, in the main system, other forms of education. So, and this is what makes the, the Olympic Games um, contingent and the whole, the whole project and contentious. Now, the Olympic Games are uh, obviously the manifestation of Olympism, what Olympism stands for, and uh, Kubitain envisaged them as um, a unique, uh, an unique, unique event which is hosted by a different country, different place each time, so they're, they're, they will based on this ambulatory principle, so they will go around the world and they will spread the gospel if you like. Uh, but from our point of view, from, from uh, social sciences point of view, it's important to recognize the Olympic Games that as a public event, they are based on a consequential logic. So this is very important. No other few of are talking about the excitement of the people who are cheering them, you know, the attention they were receiving and all the rest. But why we end up in a situation like this? Because the Olympic Games represent something else. They are point beyond themselves. So because they promote the notion of um, excellence, which very few of us can actually achieve, um, they, um, uh, they represent values and, and ideals that are um, important for um, humans all over the world. So this is what um, really uh, gives them the, the, the prominence and the attraction. And um, so when we spectate or when we watch, when we attend the Olympic Games, we always think about their symbolic um, value and symbolic power. It's not just the entertainment side of the, uh, the story, but also the, the, the symbolism behind, which is critical. Um, 
So um, this is why when we also analyze the lymphogase, we uh, take a critical eye on that. Um, um, we will come to uh, talk to you in, in a few minutes, and I'll touch on some of these issues. Now, um, very briefly, um, what we know today as the Olympic Games obviously has a very, rather long history, uh, which dates back from the um, ancient Greek times. And the um, one of the very first um, researchers that ventured into this area was an uh, Oxford-based scholar called Joseph West, who published his first Olympic ever dissertation on the uh, National Olympic Games back in 1749. And the main conclusion of this first scientific study um, by West was that the um, National Olympic Games were uh, a political institution. Um, that was his main conclusion. So as much as we would like to believe that sport is neutral, sport is um, um, an activity in job by every, every, everyone in the world. In fact, sport has always been um, highly politicized. And of course, the national games are very uh, different from uh, the modern games. They were first and most of all uh, religious festivals, and they were ex um, exclusive because only Greek citizens were allowed to participate in the games, not women were allowed. Uh, but first and most of all, they were a political institution, the main role of which was to shape Society and all citizens who will be um, well to their city state who will be protecting and their city state who will, who will fight for, for their city state. Not, not much has changed, I would have to say, when I think about how we use and how we perceive the modern Olympic Games. And, and this is a very um, uh, a, a quick um, a list of some of the early modern revivals of the Olympic Games. So as you can see, um, what happened in ultimately in 1996, the first modern Olympic Games, was actually preceded by a number of different attempts and events. And one of the key interesting events um, that took place and which was hugely influential for Kubotan's view was the Match Wembley Games uh, organized in a small Shropshire village. Match Wembley uh, from 1849 by a local doctor by the name of uh, and, and of course there were a few other events, this is not a specific list. And finally of course we uh, come to the uh, 1894 uh, Sorbonne meeting in Paris where we present the presentation and the first meeting that took um, place in Athens two years later in 1896 and the rest of the say is, is the history. And the Olympic Games, uh, obviously, the, the first games were attended only by uh, artists from 13 countries. And now, um, uh, some of your colleagues back then used to run both the 100 meters and the marathon at the same time. Imagine the same ball running marathon a few days after he completed the 100 meters race, but that was back then in 1896. The this is a very quick list of the, the claims of the Olympic movement, and as you can see, uh, the Olympic movement made claims about education because it's about educating young people in uh, the moral and ethical values which they need to hold, the international understanding how we all need to appreciate other cultures, and you will see uh, a couple of minutes how Tokyo has been trying to promote this particular message, we like equal opportunities, uh, which means that Sport should be open to everybody, regardless of their um, background, religion, gender, um, political inclinations. Uh, fair and equal competition, this is particularly the idea of um, sport without um, violence, without drugs, without cheating. Uh, cultural expression, independence of sport, and uh, personal excellence. So, so these are all different claims. And if you see um, uh, then uh, different levels, the International Olympic Committee and Olympic Women will forge partnerships with a number of different agencies with a view to be able to promote all these claims. And this is where the, the story gets really complicated, but we're not going to go into the details of this, just to give you a sense of how complex the modern Olympic movement really is. Um, when we try to pursue all these different claims, 
uh, inevitably has to deal, you have to interact with a range of different agencies at national, local, international level, and of course they all have different agendas. So as you can imagine, it's not very easy to actually pursue the, um, the agenda of the Olympic movement. Uh, I was also asked to talk a little bit about the Paralympic movement, but um, Noel already covered quite a bit of this. So what I'm going to do is just to um, focus on one particular aspect of um, the Paralympic movement. And this has to do with the changing attitudes, societal attitudes about disability. And in this regard, Noel was absolutely right. London was a game changer in many regards. The, uh, historically, traditionally, disability uh, was considered as uh, not really um, a condition which was not desirable in society. In the earliest society, the Romans and the Greeks, they even used to um, uh, kill those who were born with some kind of disability because they, they, they were just not they couldn't use them and they couldn't be um, co couldn't contribute to. Uh, life of society. Uh, and later on, uh, disability was framed in medical terms. It was described, it was uh, framed as a medical condition. And as a result of this, obviously people with some sort of disability they have to be offered some sort of treatment. But gradually, um, due to some of the events which I already mentioned, but also all the changes in society, the social model of disability started to take shape which promotes the idea that actually disability is a condition, it's a construct, it's a construct, it's a social construct. And um, it is, this is why it was very important how we as a society define disability. So if we just accept this as a condition and we offer the opportunities to people to uh, participate and, and to get involved, uh, then um, uh, we end up with a very different uh, scenario. Um, no already mentioned, in terms of um, organization, in terms of institutionalizing sports with disability, it's, it's a very long story. And um, I, I also used to believe, probably, we, we got the ultimate expert in disability in the room, I'm very pleased, and um, Britain is here, he can answer any specific questions. But I used to believe until very recently that actually uh, 1948 was the ultimate start with Paralympic movement. In fact, um, I recently read an article that uh, in the Czech Republic, they had a much longer history of this really sport of an organization, but due to you know, the, the, the lack of um, governmental support and backing, they couldn't quite establish disability sport the way it was established uh, in Britain. Anyway, uh, there are a number of different forms of disability and which of course means that there are a number of different organizations responsible for running uh, different sports of you know, different kinds of disability. And it was very difficult to actually bring them together into one body, but which was eventually achieved back in 1990, uh, sorry, 1989. Uh, but unfortunately, back in uh, 1995, the, the, uh, the organization of the deaf people decided that they would go along and, and they, they left the Paralympic movement. But, the important point is that the International Paralympic Committee was established back then, and as you can see, this is an important logo. Do you know the meaning of the, the Paralympic logo? I mean, these are the agitos uh, in Latin, I mean, I can move. And this is the message of the Paralympic uh, logo. I mean, I can move, I, I can do things. And uh, this is what the International Paralympic Committee aspires to do. They, they aspire to make um, for a more inclusive society for people with an impairment through para sport. Um, and this is the ambition, this is the mission of the, the Paralympic sport. And of course they promote a range of uh, different values, um, more specific courage, inspiration, and uh, other central values. I also got a, a little uh, history of the, the Paralympic movement. As you can see some of the figures here, the number of countries and the number of participating athletes, Paralympic movement has moved significantly since the early stages back in the, uh, uh, right after the Second World War uh, until recently. And indeed, London and Rio were um, very significant achievements for the Paralympic movement. The 
Blanc also hinted uh, that, uh, well, unfortunately, the, the games and what they stand for have been hugely commercialized. So not everything in, in our house, in the Olympic movement, has been uh, perfectly good life. And uh, I, um, there are plenty of examples of the commercialization of the, the, um, the Olympic Games and Olympic movement. Even the, um, if you talk to uh, Olympic officials, they will uh, talk about the Olympic brand. Okay? So um, they will emphasize the importance of the brand. So the Olympics have, have become a brand. They stand for something else. Uh, which is the commodification of the games. And I just listed here a number of examples. Sydney was probably the, the first um, important turning point in the, the, the current commercialization of the games um, because they opened the first Olympic store in Sydney and they were very proud that they offered uh, about 3,000 different product lines. And as, as you can see, this is an apron uh, from Athens. Uh, this is the product, um, and in 2012 we already have the, uh, the mega store. So it's not just the first Olympic store, but in London we have the, the mega store. And um, when I landed in Rio last year, uh, it was a very long corridor, the airport, very long corridor from the uh, within the terminal. It took about 20 minutes, and if you walk down the corridor, and there was only one face you see all the time. That was the same more and busy. There was no other advertiser, it was just this. Uh, we all understand the importance of funding and finance for, for athletes so they can train and perform and all the rest, but um, as you can see, uh, the commercialization of um, the games has really progressed, and London was very proud to offer more than 10,000 different product lines. I mean, any, any, everything you can think of was actually on our class of the product. <coughs> the problem is not just with the number of different products, but the whole process behind this, which actually uh, um, us, uh, Michael Real, uh, wrote about. Commodification reduces the value of any art or object um, to all its monetary exchange value, right. ignoring mm -hmm. historical, artistic, or um, a relational added values. This is very important. And the reason we enjoy and still value and appreciate the Olympic Games is precisely because they're historic value and the those universal uh, characteristics they share. Um, so there is a danger that um, commercialization uh, is not necessarily doing a huge favor for um, the Olympic Games. So this is one of the, um, the downsides. Now, uh, moving on to uh, the next Olympic Games in Tokyo, uh, and what lessons can be learned from uh, the history of uh, the Olympic Games. The, uh, the, the, the vision of Tokyo is that sport has the power to change the world and our future. So this is a direct reference to the very notion of the Olympic Games and what Olympism stands for. Sport has the power to change. The question, of course, is how we do that. How we use sport and whose life we're going to change and in what way. There is a huge belief, as far as I understand, in Japan, there is a huge belief that the uh, 1964 games were a turning point in Japan because they helped politically bring back Japan to the international community. As I'm sure you will remember the developments of the um, Second World War, uh, Second World War, uh, Japan, Germany were banned from participating in the Olympic Games. So um, they only returned in um, 1952 games, and then the 64 games was an opportunity for Japan to welcome the world. Um, so um, so the, the, the Tokyo 2020 games are also uh, perceived as an opportunity to welcome the world and to share um, the history uh, of Japan and to um, promote positive reforms and, um, based on three particular concepts. The first is striving for uh, your personal best, which is again a core value of Olympism, um, achieving your personal best. Uh, the second idea is accepting one another, the unity in diversity. Uh, and this is very important, very important to appreciate other cultures, not necessarily to try and mold and shape them um, according to your, to your own visions and culture, but rather to accept them as they are and to interact with them. And of course, if you pay attention to this one, 
passing on legacy for the future or connecting to tomorrow. In other words, this is behaving responsibly. What we do today uh, should really make sense in a few years' time and maybe um, um, more years to come. And if you look at the logo, uh, official logo of the games, it's actually based on the um, Japanese concept of Ichimatsu Moya. I'm not sure if my pronunciation um, is anywhere close to um, Japanese, but this is the whole idea of cultural diversity. So um, the um, official logo of um, Tokyo Games um, communicates this idea. The, um, if you look at the, the previous Olympic Games hosted by Japan, for example, and if you read the official report of the, um, um, well, of course, it should be 64, um, 64 Tokyo Games, for example, the word legacy um, doesn't appear at all. You won't find the word legacy. But it, it's very prominent in um, all the communications and the activities um, of the organizing community. Uh, the 1972 Sport Games also they didn't mention anything about legacy at all. It was only in the United States Games in 1998 uh, when the, the word legacy only appears three times uh, in relation to leaving some uh, legacy for winter sports in Japan, and that was it. Uh, and now, obviously, uh, Tokyo is talking about uh, leaving a unique legacy, and in particular, promoting uh, this cultural diversity. This is also a reference to Kubeten's um, own ideas. Uh, just before his death in 1937, Kubeten was very disappointed by the fact that uh, people were still not quite getting the message of cultural diversity. Uh, and they were not really appreciating the importance of bringing different cultures together so they can interact, they can learn from, from uh, each other. And to reinforce this message, I um, run a, a quick analysis of the new sports that are going to be on the program of the Tokyo Games. Um, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the, the, the program of the games, but these are the five new sports that will um, be included in the program of the Tokyo Games. You may ask why this particular sport. Well, there, there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, but one of the key reasons is that the Olympic Games have been losing gradually their appeal to young people. So uh, because of the excessive commercialization, because of the uh, rigid organization, if you like, and many other factors, changing lifestyles and all the rest, young people have not necessarily been following the games, they were not watching the games uh, as much as we would like. So uh, the International Olympic Committee has been thinking for many years how to address the situation. And they, they launched a number of different initiatives, one of which, of course, is the uh, Youth Olympic Games, uh, which are probably uh, a pilot for the, the format of the Olympic Games in the future because they're very different in, in style, in structure, and everything else. But these sports, if you look at the, the, these sports, I mean, these are all sports practiced by young people, uh, mostly. Skateboarding, sport climbing, surfing, these are all very exciting new sports. The reason I got this slide here is because this, is, this analysis is taken from the um, uh, report of the International Security Evaluation Commission. This commission was charged to evaluate uh, a number of different sports. The original, the original list was uh, eight sports. And their role, their job was to identify five sports that will meet a number of different criteria to be included in the program of the Olympic Games. And more importantly, they will add value to the program and the games. Okay? So, and on the right hand side, you can see actually the number of participants in Japan by sport, a different sport, and the number of registered participants, a different sport. And as you can see, there is a very uh, diverse number of participants and registered participants. Obviously, uh, baseball and softball hugely popular in Japan. Um, you know, four and a half million people participate on a regular basis. But registered participants uh, less than two million. So, what does this figure tell us? It tells us that the structure of sport is not quite there. 
so, for example, you don't have to necessarily have the network of clubs and associations and other organizations that can actually um, um, provide different opportunities for people to participate. And things get even more interesting when we uh, move down the list. So, for example, if you look at the skate uh, boarding, I mean, look at the number of registered participants in Japan. About 1,000 people only registered. And a similar story for um, sport climbing, for example. Only 340 clubs in a country of 120 million people, 10,000 registered participants, and the same with, with, with surfing. And when you read the analysis of the um, National Community Evaluation Commission, you will see how actually this added value was described. And it, you start to realize that we probably have a chance, we have a problem here. Because all these sports have been described um, um, as a form of lifestyle. So, for example, uh, baseball was, was described as number one spectator sport. Pay attention, spectator sport. In other words, this is a, a sport which can draw spectators, which means television audiences, uh, advertisers, sponsors, and all the rest. Then, karate was described as spectator friendly, and skateboarding as youthful and urban oriented. Okay, if skateboarding is to be practiced in Austin cities, how about rural areas? And Japan is not necessarily um, only uh, uh, big cities, but also uh, huge um, other areas. And sport timing was described as a um, fresh, dynamic lifestyle. So again, reference to lifestyle, not necessarily to increasing values uh, that Olympism is supposed to stand for. And the same for um, surfing, which is a modern blend of sport performance, lifestyle, and youth culture. Who is youth culture? So these are all, these are all, with the exception of karate, of course, uh, Western sports. And um, in my in my view, the uh, Tokyo's reference to uh, diversity uh, is also meant to make us at least more sensitive about the importance of imposing you know, other cultural activities on uh, you know, in the life of people uh, in other societies. Um, um, Japan is, uh, should be very proud because Japan was responsible for introducing judo into the Olympic program, the first non-Western sport on the Olympic program, and this has huge cultural um, re um, uh, importance. So um, I personally would be um, uh, very careful not to jump into any Conclusions with regard to the success of the, the new sport because they, they, they communicate they represent around the cultural values. Thank you very much for your attention.